Okay, good morning. Today we are um, we're going to talk about uh, when they say peace and security. Um, this was a week that uh, I sometimes early in the week I have about uh, three or four things I want to talk about. By the time I sit back here and finish up in the morning Sunday mornings, I have about fifteen or twenty or thirty or 40, and today was no exception. Now, this was a week where, uh, so I, I try to talk on different themes here, things that relate to <coughs> indicators that we live in a period of time where, uh, as we've noted before, all these different things that we know are gonna come about prophetically are starting to be put in place. We, um, some of those things, there, there are major themes. Of course, there are uh, apostasy and false teaching in the church. I'll talk a little bit about that today. There are, and I apologize for my voice. I, as you know, I had some surgery a couple weeks ago, and they scratched my throat a bit, which makes me cough, which affects my voice. So I'll talk as long as I, well, no, I can't talk as long as I can today because, but I'll talk as long as my voice holds out. We talk about apostasy in the church because Jesus warned us many times that deception is one of the harbingers of the end times. And we see that in many, on many, many levels everywhere. We sort of see this growth of a one world religion, uh, one world government, geopolitics, the Middle East, Israel, anti-Semitism. All these things are things that we know that are going to increase and become very turbulent in the end times to the point where, as I've noted many, many times, this is from many years ago, this is foreign policy, and I would say that this has not changed. But this was an interesting week, and the reason why I selected the title, when they say peace and security, and I know that's not exactly what 1 Thessalonians 5 says, but it was what everyone was talking about this week. There were security conferences, peace and security conferences everywhere. One was actually called peace and security. <laughs> Another was called security. Everybody was talking about peace or security or both. In fact, here's a little clip from Vice President Mike Pence at the 2019 Munich Security Conference in Munich, Germany. Under President Donald Trump, the United States will seize every opportunity to achieve peace. But we will approach every challenge with our eyes wide open. We will deal with the world as it is, not as we wish it to be. Well, there, is, uh, there are a lot of things that we could talk about in terms of what's going on in the church. There are, uh, everywhere you look, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a church, and there might be a couple big conferences each year. It Usually it was like, the Southern Baptist Convention would hold a conference or the fellowship we were part of would hold a national conference. But now there are conferences almost every week. For example, here's one at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary just la a couple weeks ago, Racial Justice Summit. And you see a lot of this social justice stuff coming into the church. Here's another conference that's coming up in, uh, next weekend, A New Era in... Orlando, a stadium gathering. It's going to be all week long. And of course, there are numerous speakers that are going to be uh, speaking at this conference. Look at some of these people. And I, uh, you know, sometimes I'll speak at a conference and I don't agree with everything that everybody else at the conference says. That should be obvious. But I try to avoid people that are um, wildly heretical, false teachers. And so this is one, and this I could show you three or four examples this week of Francis Chan and who he is speaking with. He's speaking with uh, Mike Bickle, see here in the lower uh, right-hand corner. Uh, and Mike Bickle was one of the Kansas City prophets back in the 80s. They went to England and they said, that the church was going to have this enormous revival in England. 
And the Kansas City Prophets consisted of Mike Bickle, Bob Jones, not the Bob Jones of Bob Jones University, but Bob Jones, he died, I think, last year, and Paul Kane. And Paul Kane, he died just this week at about the age of 91 or 92, and he was a confessed homosexual and alcoholic and unrepentant. Uh, when he, they tried to restore him, but he continued to be involved in all of these conferences and everything. Some of the other speakers in the top row of that, uh, Bill Johnson from Bethel Church. I could, Todd White is also there, Lou Engel. Bill Johnson, um, we could do a couple, three, four weeks or months on, on the problems with Bethel Church. Uh, the students that go to Bethel call their school of spirituality or spiritual ministry Christian Hogwarts because of the mysticism that's involved. Here's another, this is also from that conference that's coming up, Lou Engel, Francis Chan, Todd White, Todd Bentley. Why would you go speak with Todd Bentley? You know, it was Paul Kane. And it was Bill Johnson and a bunch of other people who went and blessed Todd Bentley a number of years ago when he was doing the Lakeland Revival down in Florida. And they had the, the New Apostolic Reformation guys, and they say, oh, there's no New Apostolic Reformation baloney. That's, they've called it that themselves that. But Bill Johnson was there, Shay on, um, a number of others. They probably, I played the clips of them prophesying over um, Todd Bentley anointing him as an apostle and it wasn't three weeks till he had left his wife and ran off with a ministry worker and but he's back in ministry um heidi baker the i i don't know i don't know why you would go speak with these people so you can uh, make your own judgments on that The Vineyard endorsed the Kansas City Prophets, by the way. And so I, I talked a little bit about some of the things going on with the local vineyard. Uh, I was digging through their website, the Vineyard website. The Vineyard endorsed the Kansas City Prophets. The Vineyard initially, John Wimber, endorsed the Toronto Blessing, the Laughing Revival. He finally backed away from it when they started getting down on the floor, rolling around on the floor, and barking like dogs, and making sounds like animals. That was a little bit too extreme. But I only bring this up because I was, I was looking through some of the things that the vineyard is into. This is um, from their Columbus, Ohio, uh, location in Columbus, Ohio, where we live. And it is a new thing. It's called the Order of Sustainable Faith. It says here, the Order of Sustainable Faith is a missional monastic order for the 21st century. We help you notice and nurture the work of God. This is Roman Catholic mysticism, endorsed by the vineyard. You, you need to understand that this is what's going on. This ecumenism, uniting with Rome. It's not just the Pope going and signing these documents with the leading Muslim cleric in the world, it's in your own communities where these partnerships are forming. Uh, look at what it says here. The schools of sustain, on the right hand side, the schools of sustainable faith guide people to embrace the con contemplative life. They help people honor Sabbath and observe life giving rhythms. They draw us toward healthy embodied spiritual practices. They nurture self-awareness and vocational clarity. They launch kingdom enterprises. This is a very different orientation in the evangelical church. It's Catholicism, Catholic mysticism. You think, I, you think I'm kidding? This is from their own website. This is actually what they say. A brief history of the Ignatian exercises. The spiritual exercises grew out of Ignatius of Loyola's personal experience of seeking to grow in union with God and to discern God's will. Who was Ignatius Loyola? He was the founder of the Jesuits. And what do we have now? The first Jesuit pope. And what's he doing? Running off and signing these documents with 
people with uh, leading a mom leading imams in the world, leading Islamic clerics. Eventually, it says here, Ignatius gathered these prayers, meditations, reflections, and directions into a carefully designed spiritual journey, which he called spiritual exercises. So don't accuse me of making a claim that I cannot back up. This is from their website. Right here, Columbus, Ohio. It's shocking. It should be shocking to you. It should be concerning. And we're going to talk about things like that here. Um, boy, this one I'll, I can, I can see the hate mail flying in already. Um, so bring it on. Pastor Steve at fbchapel.com. <laughs> So I have, I have appreciated uh, things that I've learned from Ravi Zacharias. But sometimes we need to speak truth first. They have a, um, I think it's called Burning Issues. Um, program at Ravi Zacharias Ministries. And the one they did this past week was, what does the Bible say about gender identity? How can I know my gender? Now, there have been some blogs that have talked about this, and the blog sites, people are pretty direct on blogs when they're anonymous. And it was, you know, how can I tell my gender? And the comments were, look in your trousers. <laughs> and a little bit more descriptive than that. But there's some truth to that. So the speaker this week was a guy named Sam Alberry, who identifies himself as a celibate gay man, an Anglican priest. And he came and talked, and one of the things that Alberry has developed is a thing called living out. And it is assessment. Um, how biblically inclusive is your church? Now, where do you think... Sam Alberry is going with this. Embracing the LGBTQ community? Absolutely. There's no question about that. Uh, if you look down here to number nine, actually I have a blow up of it. Um, the, here's just one of the things. This is how you assess your church. Church family members, and I talked about this a couple months ago. This is endorsed, by the way, this is being pushed by Tim Keller. Big time. It's coming into the Southern Baptist churches. It's coming into the Gospel Coalition. They have these revoice conferences. And one of the main speakers at this is Sam Alberry. And now Sam Alberry has been was invited to and spoke at Ravi Zacharias Ministries this week about what does the Bible say about gender identity? Well, I know what Jesus said about gender identity when he was asked a question by the Pharisees about marriage, he said, well, in the beginning, God created them what? Male and female. Now, that pretty much settles it for me. Now, this is not to say that there is not a thing called gender dysphoria and people suffer from this, and there are many reasons, sometimes complex reasons for this, sometimes sin, sometimes abuse, and that type of thing. That's not to um, denigrate these people, but the biblical model is clear. God created male and female. And one of the harbingers, I think, of the end times is the confusion that has arisen around this particular issue and the agenda where it's being pushed and shoved down everyone's throats. To the point where a number of leading ministries like the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities and another major organization have essentially entered into a compromise with the LGBTQ community on this particular issue, not to make too much of an issue of it. Why? Because they don't want to get sued in court. There's, there's a thing called lawfare, like warfare, lawfare, where people, you get sued and it's expensive. And in America, you don't get usually to recover your attorney's fees. And I can tell you, attorneys are expensive. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But, 
but it, it, it's a way of damaging people. And, and, and what happened, man, I am really off track already. <laughs> During the Obama administration, there were these huge financial settlements with financial institutions. And I don't know why people don't make more of this. I've talked about this in the past. What happened was those, that financial money, the billions of dollars that came in, the Obama administration funneled the left-wing uh, nonprofits and advocacy groups. It did. It, it's, there's no doubt about it. Maybe Trump could hire somebody from the Obama administration to tell them how to funnel money to building a wall or something like that. But you need to understand that this actually happened and it's documented. These multi-billion dollar settlements with Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan and stuff, that money didn't necessarily go to the victims. It didn't go to the victims, it went to advocacy groups. And it was the way, remember Obama said, hey listen, Congress doesn't act, I got a pen and paper and I'll do what I need to do. And he did, he actually said everything that he was going to do and he did it. So here is this, this thing, church family members instinctively share meals, homes, holidays, festivals, money, family life with others from different backgrounds and life situations to them. And one of the things they advocate is same-sex marriage, same-sex partners, being your children being exposed to them. There's an agenda here. So I'm going to play a clip. There's some controversy about what Sam Alberry said. So I thought, okay, let's do this. What did Sam Alberry actually say? So he talks about three things. He's going to talk about just sort of a general topic, then David, then Jesus. But I want you to see what, what he's trying to bring in. And is his base scripture to look at culture through scripture, or is it the other way around? You decide, here's what he said. Secondly, we can avoid unhelpful gender stereotypes. David was the surprise choice as king of Israel precisely because he didn't look like the kind of person you imagined the king to be. He didn't come from central casting. They didn't even put him on the shortlist because they just assumed, well, David, not David. Whatever you've got in mind of a king is not him. As David is introduced to us in the, in the book of 1 Samuel, we're, we're told literally that he was beautiful, and the Hebrew word is the word used only ever to describe women. In contemporary language, David was a pretty boy. And he was someone who spent an inordinate amount of time playing a harp and writing poems about his feelings. They're called the Psalms, they're great. <laughs> and my fear is that many people would look at David today and say, David must have gender dysphoria. Or you think of some of the feisty women in the Old Testament and again, many people would have looked at them today if they were growing up in our contemporary culture and said, well, Probably some gender identity issues going on there. And the only hope for our brokenness in our own bodies is the ultimate brokenness of his body. He knew what it was like for his body to cause him enormous pain. He knew what it was like, if, you, if I can put it this way, to have body image issues because we're told in Isaiah 53 that people turned their faces away from him. People couldn't bear to look at him. His body image issues weren't in his head. They were real. The kind of people who are normally, do you call them rubberneckers here? When there's an accident on the interstate who will slow down to have a really good look. There was something about Jesus on the cross that was so appalling, people would actually look the other way. It was more than they could cope with. And there was no greater dysphoria than when he who knew no sin became sin for us. That is the ultimate experience of being in the wrong flesh. Now, I have... 
Look, I was a pastor's kid. Church was like an extension of our home. And we had Sunday morning, we had Sunday school, we had church. Like when you were young kids, you went to church. I don't think it damaged us. Um, we had Sunday night, we went to church. We had Wednesday night, we went to church and Bible study. Sometimes we'd have a boys or girls program. And in the boys program, we had boys, and in the girls program, we had girls. In fact, in that girls program, my wife was the National Girl of the Year in 1970. Good choice, I think. <laughs> the, um, I didn't know her at that time. Um, and the, there's a long story behind that, but that's for another time. But I took in my areas of study in social sciences, criminology, and sociology, I took a lot of classes on deviancy, sexual issues, that type of thing. I studied the Bible. I can tell you that in my life, I have never, ever, ever heard someone try to connect Isaiah chapter, the, the wonderful truths and prophecies in Isaiah 53 to gender dysphoria. I find that disgusting and shocking. And there is this myth out there that David and Jonathan were homosexual lovers. And I tell you, I, I can almost guarantee you that this man believes it. What is he doing speaking at Ravi Zacharias Ministries? Why was he allowed to speak? Why, when he says this stuff, did somebody not go up and grab the microphone and say, you're not going to teach that in this ministry? Why did that not happen? What is going on? I will tell you what's going on. Second Peter chapter 1 gives us some guidance. According as his divine power, verse 3, Second Peter 1, 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That, these, that by these, by these promises, ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Do you see the connection between this gender-bending, dysphoric teaching that's being drug into the church and shoved down people's throats and what Second Peter had to say about what was going on? Look at what he continues to say. And besides this, giving all due diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue, knowledge. There is a progression of development in your growth as a Christian. Diligence, faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. You see how this progression happens. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see far off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Second Peter chapter 2 picks up and continues on with this theme. And it says... But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. In the ESV it says, false prophets also arose among you, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in <coughs> destructive heresies, 
even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow what? Their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be vast blasphemed. It goes on in 2 Peter chapter 2, and it's a passage we reference a lot of time, to talk about uh, Noah and Sodom and Gomorrah. And then in verse 8, it, sa in, in, it says in verse 7, and delivered just Lot from Sodom and Gomorrah just before God's wrath was poured out on those places, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The nor knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, so to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. Presumptions, presumptuous they are they, self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Sounds like Washington, D.C. Sounds like Congress. Sounds like the House of Representatives. <laughs> Whereas angels, whether which are greater in power, might bring not railing accusation against them before the Lord. But these, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. There is a very serious consequence to what this nonsense that people talk about and what they push as social justice, sexual gender equality. Having eyes full of adultery that they cannot cover, verse 14, and that they cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls in, a, in heart, they have exercised with covetous practices, practices cursed children which they have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam and the son of Basar, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumbass speaking with man's, that's by the way, that's in the King James. The dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, does this not sound like what, Sam, go listen to the whole thing. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption for whom a man is over, uh, for of whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought in bondage. For if they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. This is really serious stuff. For if they had been, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Thus says the word of the Lord. I wrestled today, and again, um, Pastor Steve at fbchapel.com if you have any <laughs> issues with that. I, I don't do it because I want to say, oh, got another one. I don't want, I don't want to do that. I'm bothered by this. I'm, I'm grieved in my heart and soul about what I see going on. It's happening, it's everywhere you look. You know, there's a, there's a statement, sort of a rhetorical question in uh, one of the gospels, I can't remember the passage right now. When the son of man comes, will he find the faith on the earth? 
And the answer to that question right now appears to me is, uh, if he doesn't hurry up, maybe not. It's, 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 it's troubling. It's disturbing. So let's look at a few other things that are going on. This, look, you need to understand, I almost called this uh, informational warfare because this, we live in that age. So here's a lady in England. She got into an online Twitter dispute. Can you imagine this, a dispute on Twitter? <laughs> this must be the first time this has ever happened. And that it was with a transgender activist who identifies now, claims to be a female, but he's a male. And guess what? He will always be male. And she, the police came and arrested her. They took her phone. They took her computer in front of her 10-year-old autistic child, took her to jail, put her in jail for seven hours. And by the way, a number of weeks have gone by. She still doesn't have her phone or computer. And she has a business that she runs with it. The thought police are here, my friends. That's England. When I was in England, I went to the British Library and I saw two of the existing copies of the Magna Carta. Right there, right, in, right below the glass in front of me. The original documents signed by King John. The originals. In England, now they do this. When we had this Green New Deal, this, I only use this as an example as to how things are going. So, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, 70 Democratic sponsors, and all the Democrat, none of the Democratic presidential candidates have spoken out against this nonsense. And she made mistakes. It, it was, it looked like something that as William F. Buckley would call them, somebody from high school or college, the incompletely educated would write. <laughs> so she retracted a lot of her reports. I saw an interview on t with Tucker Carlson, one of her spokespeople, I think he's a law professor from Cornell or something, and he goes like, it, it, look it up. I, I didn't have time to pull the clip. And he was like, well, no, that's not, that's not what she meant. And I mean, he was so good in his lying that he even threw Tucker Carlson back on his heels. And they said, well, this, it was a Republican plot to put this on her website. <laughs> so somebody did, look, there's a wonderful thing here called the Internet Archive. And it's really, it's kind of a way that you can play God for a little bit. Because God keeps a record <laughs> of what we do. Everybody like, oh, you know, Facebook is tracking me. Hey, listen, I'm more worried about the one who holds the power of life and death and can destroy your soul in hell forever than I frankly am about Zuckerberg or any of those other people. But, so the Internet Archive, you can go back and here's what you'll see. The Green New Deal fr frequently asked questions. And it says down here, e economic security for all of those who are unable or unwilling to work. This is what she wrote, and somebody in her office put it up on her website. And so when it got caught, here's the headlines in the New York Times. Ocasio-Cortez retracts faulty report on Green New Deal, but on the webpage it said, Ocasio-Cortez team flubs a Green New Deal summary and Republicans pounce. How dare the Republicans point out a mistake. Like, they never point out what they think is a mistake that President Trump makes. It's, it's insane. Now we see this with the wall. Border communities are starting legal challenges against the wall. Suits have already been filed. Um, so we'll see, how that, um, we'll see how that works out. I, you know, my, here's, my, here's what I've said before. I don't know if I've said it here. So El Paso sues and says, we don't want the wall built by our community. So you don't want the ball built along the southern part of El Paso or the western part, whatever parts touch the border of Mexico. So what you do is you go, okay, we're going north of El Paso and building the wall. Okay, you don't want the, you, you live on the, uh, El, uh, near the Rio Grande River, you don't want, okay, we'll go, I mean, I don't care if we have to go 20 miles north, we'll build the walls 20 miles north, and you can be 
on the other side of the wall if you want. And if we have to go to Oklahoma to find somebody that's willing to sell, we'll build the wall up there. That's my view. Uh, but I'm not in charge. Um, so they, um, this young gal, lady, young lady who was killed, Jewish lady who was killed in Israel a week ago, they caught the killer. He's confessed, he reconstructed the attack, and it was clearly a terrorist attack. And outside of Jerusalem Post and Israeli newspapers and conservative websites, news sites, you hardly even see this mentioned. She was brutally stabbed, raped, and killed. Palestinian authorities said, if we have one dollar, we will spend it on martyrs. Like this guy, his family will get money. It's, um, it's insane. This was the week of the 40th anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. And this is from uh, the leader Ayatollah Khamenei's website. Great graphics and artwork showing the diverse nature of the people of Iran, of course, following the leader the imam, he's the one who's really in charge. You don't see any of the other politicians from Iran there. The second phase of the revolution, a statement addressed to the Iranian nation. It's a couple pages long, you can find it on the web. Here's the English translation of part of it. Today, the challenges concern Iran's strong presence near the borders of the Zionist regime putting an end to the United States unlawful infiltration in the West Asia, the Islamic Republic's support of the Palestinian people's resistance at the heart of the occupied territories, as well as defending the high-flying flag of Hezbollah and the resistance throughout this region. Well, that led to a lot of reports coming out. There were intelligence reports released this week. I don't know if it's the this is the week they're usually dumped, but um, there was an intelligence report from Israel, an assessment from military intelligence release that said that Iran could, they thought, obtain nukes within two years. It also said that Israel was likely to expand its covert, for, covert war against Damascus beyond, or against Iran beyond Damascus. And part of that is because Iran is withdrawing its bases around Damascus and putting them elsewhere further north in Syria. And if they're not there, then why are they withdrawing? There was also a report this week later confirmed by Prime Minister Netanyahu, and a lot of you who've been to Israel have been to the overlook of Kenitra in the Golan Heights, and there were uh, tank shells, artillery shells launched into Syria by Israel they destroyed a tank and some other buildings there in that area around Kenitra. And a lot of you have seen it. And Brian, our video technician, was in Israel this week, and I said, did you, did you see any? And he goes, I didn't even know it happened. Uh, so bad luck, he could have been there that day when they were firing artillery shells. There was a... Uh, so one of the peace and security summits this week was the <coughs> Warsaw Summit. Now there were different aspects to it. Vice President Pence was there and spoke. Uh, they had uh, sort of second tier people from European nations. There were a bunch of Arab nations there it was very interesting the way it was constructed, where people sat and that type of thing. One of the things that happened there was Jared Kushner came in and gave a summary of the United States of President Trump's peace plan and what he's going to do. 
Uh, one person who was absent was, I'll get back to the Munich or the Warsaw Summit in just a moment. Here was a question that was asked by Arab News and the Wall Street Journal. Well, Wall Street Journal asked, where's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman? And of course, then the next day on the, <laughs> so the Arab News people, it's a government-sponsored publication in Saudi Arabia, must read the Wall Street Journal because they answered it. It says, there he is, kissing the black stone at the Grand Mosque in Mecca because he will succeed to the title keeper of the holy places if he becomes king. Um, we have any Semitism growing in our country that uh, Somalian Muslim congresswoman from Minneapolis, from Minnesota came out and apologized for her anti-Semitic tweets, essentially implying that Jews' money controls all the world. And the only reason that people in Congress support the state of Israel is because they're getting paid money by the Jews. So, now I support Israel. I don't agree with everything they do. I said this once before. I got, got in a lot of trouble for it. I said, I don't support everything that Israel does. I, I would have bombed Iran a long time ago. <laughs> now, I'm trying to make a little bit of humor. But... She apologized, and so everything's okay, right? She, she's changed her mind. No, she's not. It's just like, I, I don't understand how Jeremy Corbyn gets away with it in the United Kingdom, and, ha and she's going to get away with it. And she's not alone in Congress the way they treat Israel. Here is a report released this week uh, by the State of Israel, Terrorists in Suits. The ties between NGOs, non-government organizations, promoting BDS and terrorist organizations. And you can look it up. You can get the PDF off the internet. This is one of the reports that was released that week <coughs> by the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs. And they have in there this chart that shows all of the, the terror ties between people that support BDS movement and actual terrorists from Hamas and other organizations. The military intelligence report that was released said that they suspected that there was a coming conflict on the, on the border with Gaza. Now here's a picture in the upper right hand corner of what's going on on the border with Gaza. There were about 11,000, 12,000 people there uh, launching balloons, kites, and that type of thing with incendiary devices. They're throwing grenades, starting fires. You see the flag of Turkey there? Turkey's funding a lot of this. Erdogan is funding a lot of this. That led to a lot of posts here in the, like, Eretz Shiva, Times of Israel, IDF warns Hamas likely to spark war in Gaza and bid for international support. Hamas is losing money. International aid is drying up. So they figure the way to do that is to provoke a war, get Israel to invade, then everybody will feel sorry for Hamas, and then they will get their funding, more funding. And the chief of the new chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces said, prepare for a Gaza conflict. Some think that it might even come from, start before the elections that are scheduled for April 9th. Don't know. Uh, Dr. Martin Sherman, he has kind of an interesting view. He gets, boy, he's really criticized. He's called a racist and all these things. And he writes a column for Arad Shiva called Into the Fray. And he says, 2019 intelligence assessment implications for Gaza. And he, he says, look, this is, um, well, here's, here's just a quote from um, him. Um, I want to make sure I get his. Well, here's the military assessment reports of this. A new challenge for the security establishment is Turkey, which is, described as a rising hostile force. And I so, so showed you the um, Turkish flag there. They have allocated more forces to learn about what is happening in Turkey under Erdogan. Uh, they also say there's problems with Iran. It says this, according to the intelligence estimate, the Judea and Samaria region, that's often called the West Bank, it's biblical Judea Samaria, has a strategic potential for escalation, but not at the same level as Gaza. According to the report, 
the cause of the escalation could be the unveiling of President Trump's peace plan, the departure of Mahmoud Abbas, they mean he passes away. I think he's, he's getting old. He's already into the 13th year of a four-year term. Uh, or other elements on the ground which could inflame the situation. Uh, Jihad, let's see. The Intelligent Department estimates that the potential for an offensive direct initiative by Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza is very high and may occur even before the Knesset elections in April. An offensive initiative can come in the form of an attack originating from a tunnel, a pinpoint operation such as shooting at a bus, and anything that will shock the system without drawing Israel into war, but could still bring a significant Israeli response. And Dr. Sherman, he's of the view, he says, listen, we, we gave up Gaza in 2005, look what happened. It's worse now than ever. It's a security situation. So he says, look, it, it's either we, we can't have, it just appears we can't live together. And he's called a racist for that, even though the Palestinians don't want a single Jew in Judea and Samaria. Um, and at the same time, he, he says, move them down to Egypt. But Egypt, does, <laughs> Egypt doesn't want them either. Egypt has just built, have you heard about New Cairo? This new capital city that they're building and trying to populate in Egypt? Matt, it's, it, they're saying within 10 years could have eight or nine million people. It's not inconsequential. And it's just like, it's another one of these things that kind of just kind of sneaks under the radar and all of a sudden, oh look, they're building this massive new capital, new Cairo in Egypt. The Moscow came out, I played a clip of the Russian official last week, says, eh, we're really not an ally with Iran. But he also, the same official came out this week and said, that we just can't justify continued airstrikes on Syria. They're not lawful. So there's this little tension that's going on and I'll, I'll address that when I finished up here in a, a while. <laughs> it was also a week, why are people talking about peace and security? First Thessalonians 5 says, here, I'll tell you what, don't take my word for it. Let's see what the scripture actually says. This is, this, it says that this is what people are going to be talking about. First Thessalonians 5, chapter 3. Well, let's just start with one. But at the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety peace and security, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. If I was writing that myself, I would say, comes upon you as pancreatitis comes upon you, <laughs> suddenly. I mean, it, one minute you don't have it, and then the next minute you think you're, you think you're dying. <laughs> But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that the day of the Lord should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do the others, but let us watch and be sober. You shouldn't be surprised by these things. But everywhere you look, the world situation is in flux. In Kashmir, a massive suicide attack claimed by Muslim terror groups took place. This is representative of the headlines from the Indian newspapers over the last couple of days. Do you see the one on the right there? Entire nation's blood is boiling. That is what the Prime Minister of India said, the most populous nation on the planet. They have nuclear weapons. They're blaming it on Pakistan. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Pakistan has been supported by Saudi Arabia. India is trying to drag China in. You see, we know these conflagrations are coming. We just don't know what the triggers are. World War I, it was this assassination of a crown prince of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in Sarajevo. What, what's going to be the trigger for all these things that we know are coming? 
don't know. On the other side of Pakistan, along the Afghanistan-Pakistan-Iranian border was another terrorist attack in which 27 Iranian Revolutionary Guard members were killed. At the funeral, the funerals, the commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard scolded Pakistan, also warning the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Sunni, Shia versus Sunni. Pakistan is largely Sunni, Afghanistan. It, it, listen, it, it's a mess. These are, these are major flashpoints. We're talking about withdrawing from Afghanistan. At the same time that this is happening, and I'm going to move into the Munich Security Conference part, but I, I just saw this in um, the Wall Street Journal the other day. China's birth rate threatens growth. China's one of the most populous nations on the planet. What, what's happening? Well, they had a one-child policy. They're now to the point, in India, they favor ch they've been boarding females. And between China and India, they're getting close to the point where they will have 200 million un <coughs> males with no marriage, no mar potential marriage partner. 200 million. I've heard this number before somewhere else. Have you? I'm not, saying that's, I'm not saying that they're necessarily connected. I'm just saying is, do the math, look at the numbers. China is scared. Russia's declining. That's why they moved into the Middle East, because they're increasing Muslim population. The tipping points are being reached in England and France and elsewhere in Europe with Muslim populations. You have a demographic uh, bomb going off. I hate to use the word. A lot of people being born in Africa. Enormous birth rates. I showed you those charts where they say some cities in Africa could have 100 million people in the next 10 or 15, 20 years. 100 million people in one city. Like 10 times New York in one city. And you'll see some other things. So China's looking, man, what do we do about this? This is why Japan has been stuck in the mud, if you will, for decades now. Remember we were afraid Japan, they were coming in, they were, they were buying Pebble Beach, golf courses, real estate and everything. And then what happened? The demographic bomb went off in Japan. And now they, have, they sell more adult diapers than children's diapers and it's impacting society. And without immigration, by the way, we would probably have the same problem here in the United States. So at the Munich Security Conference, they issued a report as part of it. This is an annual conference. All the leaders and the elite of the world go. Mike Pence was there, Lindsey Graham, Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Angela Merkel, people from China. I mean, it, it, was, ever, it was who's who took place just after the Munich, or the Warsaw Conference. Um, here's what, what the subtitle of the report really says. Munich Security Report, The Great Puzzle, Who Will Pick Up the Pieces? Now, who do you think they're blaming for destroying the world order? Trump. Donald Trump, of course. And so everybody was there to talk about how do we put the world back together that Donald Trump has destroyed. In the report, there's a section on the relationship between France and Germany. There's a section on the terrorism networks and that type of thing and how they're interrelated in, Afri in Northern Africa. You see how complex this is? You could take all those lines and everything and you could transpose them on Syria, which they've done a bit up there. This is um, a huge problem. They look at different things like uh, military capabilities in 2018, looking at the different um, capacities of Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. So Israel has 490 tanks, Iran up 1,500 there at the top. 
and Turkey has 2,379. So that you can blow that up and look at it later. Uh, talks about some of the things, chemical attacks that are going on in Syria. It also talks about the frequency of Israeli airstrikes in Syria. One of the things that it also talks about, though, was also in some of the newspapers this week. This was from, I think the left-hand one is the Jerusalem Post, and the right-hand one is the Wall Street Journal. Art of the growth of artificial intelligence and how that rates, relates to military power. And I would say how it relates to other things we know are coming in the end times. And top cybersecurity experts said the crisis worse than 9-11 could emerge from the artificial intelligence arms race. Here's what the article talked about. A nightmare scenario could be use of algorithms to make four million Toyota cars all crash at the same time. This Munich security report also talked about the growth of artificial intelligence and who's spending money. On the right is the US, leads the way, then China, then the rest of the world. Um, what the increases in spending on this. So the first thing that happened before this was the Munich security, not the Warsaw Secu Peace and Security Conference. It was actually titled, well, you'll see it at the end of this clip. Uh, keep the sound down on this clip, guys. But um, this is Prime Minister Netanyahu. He put this, this video up on Twitter. I've just come from an excellent meeting with uh, the, Prime, the Foreign Minister of Iran. We discussed additional steps that we can take together for the region in order to advance common interest. This will continue. From here, I'm going to meeting with 60 foreign ministers and envoys of countries from around the world against Iran. What is important about this meeting, and this meeting is not in secret because there are many of those, is that this is an open meeting with representatives of leading Arab countries that are sitting down together with Israel in order to advance the common interest of war with Iran. Now, he took a lot of heat with the comment, war with Iran. It was later changed on his Twitter page to combating, and there was an article in the, the Jerusalem Post this morning about he was misquoted, uh, but this is the video that he, his staff put up on uh, Twitter originally. And um, you'll see here at the end of the video here in just a second, the actual title of the conference in Warsaw. This was put on by the United States, held in Warsaw, Poland. And Netanyahu is a very major person at this conference. Little Israel's prime minister was literally front and center. And it appears I, I didn't get the uh, last port of the clip. So Jared Kushner was there to give a summary of his peace plan. Here's what the article, um, one of the articles said in the Wall Street. U.S. President Donald Trump's senior Middle East advisor, son-in-law Jared Kushner, said Thursday that the Trump administration would unveil its much-awaited Middle East deal of the century after the Israeli elections on April 9. Kushner briefed participants at a security conference in Poland about the plan, but would not go into the details for fear of it leaking, according to a diplomat who watched the presentation. But he did say that the plan would be released sometime after Israel's upcoming elections, the diplomat spoke on condition of anonymity according to protocol. So we don't know what's in it, a lot of things. It was interesting that while this conference was going on, Mahmoud Abbas went to Saudi Arabia and met with King Salman, and King Salman came out and said, hey, we still support the Palestinian state. And I didn't have time to edit it. I'll try to edit it for next week. There was a video also released by Prime Minister Netanyahu's offers of, I, of a recording of the Arab foreign ministers. I don't know if it's still up on the internet. I was able to grab a copy before it was taken down. Talking about, they really have a common cause with Israel against Iran. And that's causing them a lot of trouble at home. Uh, Pompeo said that without confronting Iran, he spoke at the conference. He took the lead on it. You can see the picture here from the Jerusalem Post. You see Mike Pompeo front and center. Uh, representative, I think, from Poland in the middle, 
And then on the left, you see Benjamin Netanyahu. So Netanyahu was very important at this conference. The Europeans, like I said, sent their second tier people. Well, when that conference ended, Peace and Security, it was called, the Peace and Security Conference, they then went to the, on to the Munich Security Conference. And it's interesting, Angela Merkel spoke there, and I talked to you, I've talked to you about um, Germany's military issues and their lack of equipment. That was confirmed in a Los Angeles Times article, well written, about problems with Germany's defense. Now it's not, you know, sometimes I said, yeah, they have four tanks that are operational. It's actually more than that. Here's the summary, which I think is accurate based on reports that I've seen along, about Germans' military woes, along with the reliability of wolves of Air Force jetliners. Now, the reason they brought up Air Force jetliners' reliability is that Angela Merkel was on her way to a conference on an Airbus, I think it was an Airbus 340, run by the German military. It stopped working, she had to come back to Germany and catch a commercial flight to wherever she was going. The Prime Minister of Germany. And this has happened a number of times. Along with the reliability was of Air Force jetliners, only about a third of Germany's 128 Eurofighter jets are combat ready, and just a quarter of its 130 Army helicopters are operational, mainly because of a shortages of spare parts. Only one of six submarines that they have, and fewer than half of 244 Leopard tanks are working, according to a recent German report to Parliament. Pence spoke at the conference. The New York Times, in an article this morning, said, Pence defends America first to a tepid crowd. So this is what uh, the Europeans found offensive was. Here's about a three minute clip of his speech. I think you should listen to it. We've also taken decisive steps to confront the greatest threat to peace and security in the Middle East. The Islamic Republic of Iran is the leading state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Iran has supported terrorist proxies and militias, Hezbollah and Hamas, exported missiles, fueled conflicts in Syria and Yemen, plotted terrorist attacks on European soil, and openly advocated the destruction of the State of Israel. Anti-Semitism is not just wrong, it's evil. And anti-Semitism must be confronted wherever and whenever it arises, and it must be universally condemned. <laughs> Yesterday, my wife Karen and I paid our solemn respects to the martyrs of the Holocaust in our very first visit to Auschwitz. It was a scene of unspeakable tragedy, but also a scene that marks the triumph of freedom. As a close friend whose grandparents survived the Holocaust said to me as we walked those grounds, the grounds of the Birkenau camp, he whispered, good always triumphs over evil. And so it did, but at horrendous cost. One lesson of that dark chapter of human history is that when authoritarian regimes breathe out vile anti-Semitic hatred and threats of violence, we must take them at their word. The Iranian regime openly advocates another holocaust, and it seeks the means to achieve it. The Ayatollah Khomeini himself has said, it is the mission of the Islamic Republic of Iran to erase Israel from the map. Two years ago, President Trump made his first overseas trip to Saudi Arabia, where he convened a historic gathering of leaders from 50 nations across the region at the Arab Islamic American Summit. As President Trump said then, and I quote, the birthplace of civilization is waiting to begin a new renaissance. He challenged the nations gathered there to work together, as, as he said, 
to meet history's great test, to conquer extremism and vanquish the forces of terrorism. Well, Zarif was also there. Again, I didn't have time to, he just spoke yesterday, I didn't have time to pull his clip off. And he just said, Look, we're not against Jews, we're just against Israel. Um, do you believe that? <laughs> I don't believe that. Look at what's happened. Listen, since 1948, the population of the Arab world, it includes Jews, the Jewish population in the Arab world has plummeted to the point where in Arab lands today, Arab and Islamic countries today, there are perhaps 7,000 Jews there were hundreds of thousands. You think this guy ever mentions that? But of course the Palestinians, which are kept in abject poverty in Arab countries to which they fled, that's all Israel's problem. This is anti-Semitism written large. Um, It's interesting to read what the Iranian press says about these conferences and what happened. Angela Merkel, she came in and she defended Europe's stance on the Iranian nuclear deal and they're creating this special purpose vehicle to get around sanctions. She said U.S. withdrawal from Syria risks boosting Russia Iranian influence yet she deals with Iran like it's just another country an article in the Tur Tehran Times says the three main messages of the Warsaw summit are these the first message is the US has been internationally isolated the second message is the link between productive terrorism and the terrorism that led to the attack in uh, eastern Iran along the Afghan Pakistani border uh, in this equation, we can see a network that includes the United States and the Zionist regime as the head, and the Tekfiri, that's the terrorist group that claim uh, responsibility, as the fingers. Executive, they execute Washington's and Tel Aviv's orders. This link has long been established between the United States and the Tekfiri terrorism. However, we have witnessed it becoming more significant over the past eight years and following the ongoing changes in the region especially in Syria and Iraq. And the third message was, essentially, Iran is growing in power and look how important we are. So we had the Warsaw Peace and Security Summit. We had the Munich Security Conference. And while all this was going on, three countries got together in Sochi, Russia, to talk about Politi the political solution in Syria. And those countries were um, Iran, Rouhani, Russia, Putin, and Turkey, Erdogan. And they had a meeting. Now look, it, it didn't go perfectly. It was, um, there's, there's tension between these countries as to how they're working out. The Wall Street Journal sort of followed up on that conference yesterday with a, a well-written article in yesterday's Wall Street Journal called Putin's Big Move Back into the Middle East. And so let me just read a couple paragraphs and then I have one more thing and we'll be finished. Last December, the day after President Donald Trump announced, abruptly announced that the US was pulling out of Syria, Vladimir Putin sounded magnanimous about the American decision. When asked at his annual year-end press conference about Mr. Trump's assessment that the Islamic State had been defeated in Syria, the Russian strongman replied, overall, I agree with the President of the United States. Is the presence of the American troops required there? I do not think it is, Putin said. Mr. Trump's move was a major victory for Mr. Putin, bolstering his effort to make Russia the Middle East new power broker. The economic and military presence of the U.S. in the region is too extensive for Moscow to replace Washington, 
But over the past three years, Mr. Putin has reestablished Russia as a major player. As a senior Israeli official told me, Russia policy in the Middle East is aggressive, flexible, and cognizant of its limits. Now, I want you to listen to this, though, because I think the article makes a major blunder, and it says that this Russian influence increased over the last three years. Actually, the increase in Russian influence and the diminishment of the United States started under a prior administration, under Barack Obama. Now, I don't know, this, look, Obama came out of nowhere. Personally, I um, am of the persuasion that he was a Russian plant. He was schooled in communism. And I would ask you, what did he do on the geopolitical stage that did not ultimately benefit Russia? You want to talk about Russian collusion? That's where you should be looking. Because this Russia didn't just burst on the scene. They moved into Syria in 2015. And in 2015, that was before the, that happened before the presidential campaign took place. Because the foundations for it had all been laid, I think, by the Barack Obama administration. That's just my personal view. So here's what the article says. Mr. Putin has shrewdly exploited the ambivalence of the United U.S. under both the Obama and Trump administrations about continuing its expansive post-9-11 presence in the region. Mr. Trump's particular focus on countering Iran's influence has given Mr. Putin the space to pursue his vision of, pragmat of a pragmatic interest-based policy. Russia is the only big foreign power that talks to all of the region's key actors. Iran, the Sunni Arab states, Israel, Turkey, the Kurds, the Palestinian Authority, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Syria. Having precipitously withdrawn from the Middle East after the Soviet collapse in 1989, Russia is back. And its growing regional influence stands as one of Mr. Putin's key foreign policy achievements alongside his new partnership with Xi, Xiang, Xi Jinping's China. No longer burdened with communist ideology, Mr. Putin's Russia has emerged as a stalwart opponent of regime change, a particular selling point of the governments of the Middle East since the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the Arab Spring of 2011. Mr. Putin has also reversed long-standing Soviet policy by cultivating two new partners, Israel and Saudi Arabia. This is very interesting when you look at how all of this fits into Bible prophecy. Mr. Putin and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu have developed close ties helped along by what Dmitry Trenin of the Carnegie Moscow Center calls the two countries shared, no-nonsense, hard-nosed, real politic based view of the world. Mr. Netanyahu is, was the only major Russian leader to attend the Victory Day Parade in Moscow last May, standing, <coughs> standing next to Mr. Putin, Putin and wearing the orange and black ribbon of St. George, a symbol of Russian sacrifice in World War II and of Mr. Putin's um, recent incursions into Crimea and Ukraine. Israel's agenda with Russia revolves around the Jewish state's nemesis, Iran. Mr. Netanyahu hopes that Mr. Putin <coughs> will use his influence uh, to restrain Iran and reduce the risk that the Syrian civil war will leave Iran and Hezbollah, its proxy in Lebanon, and a pro-Assad fighting force in Syria closer to Israel's northern border with a bigger, more lethal arsenal. Again, I think that uh, to the extent that Russia is involved in Ezekiel 38 and 39, this is power from the north. The way I read it is that they're, they're reluctant. It's a, it's a reluctant power. They're drawn in. And I think this article sort of um, says this. I'll finish with this paragraph. Russia's warming relationship with Israel is particularly striking given centuries of officially sanctioned anti-Semitism under both the Tsars and the Soviets. For all of Mr. Putin's authoritarian tendencies, Russian Jews are now freer to practice their religion and to participate in public life than at any other time in Russian history. Russia's ties to Israel have also been deepened by some 1.2 million Israelis you go to certain cities in Israel, you're more likely to hear Russian spoken than English or Hebrew or anything else. The countries now have visa-free travel and flourishing business ties, especially in the high-tech sector. And then it goes on to describe his deepening ties with Saudi Arabia. So what do we make of all of this? All this week, we saw everybody who's in charge 
for lack of a better term, a biblical term, the kingdoms of this world coming together to try to figure out how do we establish foundations for peace and security. And they had this plan and this report and this intelligence assessments and this military intelligence report. The Bible talks about this. Jesus used the example of a man whose house was built on sand. And when the floods came, the foundations went away and the city, the house collapsed. So let's make this practical. We know what the leaders of the world do, but what is your foundation today? Is it the cultural norms that you saw in that talk earlier in my talk? Is it geopolitics and the hope that certain things will be happening and make our life better? Biblically, our foundation, our solid rock is Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ because he finished, he did everything that you needed to have a right relationship with God. He bore our sins on the cross. He lived the perfect life. He was crucified. He bore our sins on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. He ascended to heaven and he is coming back. Remember the song? On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is what? Sinking sand. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the solid rock on which we can stand. Bless us this week, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.